Support the Amigos podcast on Patreon or PayPal and receive cool perks and rad swag. Visit our page at everythingamiga.com slash support. Amiga, the first personal computer that gives you a creative edge. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Amigos. I'm John. And, and I'm today, Aaron. Aaron. We're going to be talking about Elite. All right, now, man. If you had to, we were just before the show, if you aren't watching live, we, we had our normal pre show banter and we were talking about our, our uh, you know, uh, curricular, extracurricular activities, uh, martial arts, wrestling, etc. cetera. Um, what would you say in life, Aaron, that you're elite at? Uh, hmm. Not much. I, I would usually consider myself a jack of all trades, uh, but I would, you know, I'll tell you something. You know, I do. I, I've started that second show called the Sketchy mm-hmm. Tech. I am il- I am an elite level sketchy. Oh tech. yeah. I do sketchy, bizarre crap. Not just with tech, but with software. Uh, I'm. I, I love. I was. I've been working on this uh, project, this Atomic Coco project, and I've been doing a lot of bodging and screwing around and software manipulating and I'm telling you Boat, I'm never so happy as when I'm, I, I'm setting, it's so much harder than what I do at work but I'm so much happier to do it, it, it so whatever that is, I'm, I'm elite at that what about yourself? Uh, I am an elite hobbyist uh, I love <laughs> hobbies <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're not the master of any no. one hobby. You're just the master of a ton That's of hobbies. That's right. Having a lot of hobbies, I agree. You, you played I'm gonna, to a I'm bunch, gonna take too. my first golf lesson next week. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no kidding, yeah, man. Golf. I am. Um, I didn't. I you played. Yeah, before, I played though, before. Right? I, I've banged it around the course for years, but I've never made any solid attempts to get better. So uh, yeah. I, uh, you know, I live. They they closed down the golf course at Shawnee. You know, so. Yeah, uh, um, but yeah. the driving range that's down there behind the armory is still there. Did you know there was an armory in Dunbar? I, okay. Oh, yeah. I've been to oh, wrestling okay. there. So, yeah, there's a driving range right behind there, and it's literally three minutes from my work. So I've been going down there. You know, it's three minutes. You go down there and hit a bucket of balls every day yeah. during lunch. And uh, I asked the guy working there. You're kidding me. During yeah, lunch? During my, during, yeah, I just okay. roll over there and do that. Um I asked the guy working there if he knew anybody that gave lessons. He's like, yeah, there's a pro that teaches here all the time. And uh, so I met him, and he's a really nice guy. He's actually my lessons in two weeks. This coming week is the West Virginia Open, the biggest golf tournament in the in the state. And so he'll be competing right. in that. But uh, on July 1st, I shall. Is that at Co- Where's that at? Coonskin? You know, that's a great question, and I didn't think to ask him. I'm not sure if. Mm-hmm. Now, where are you going to be taking your Just lessons? Just there at the at? range. Oh, so you're not going to an actual golf no, course? I, I think it, yeah. I think at first it's just working on the swing, and then once I get that mm-hmm. down. But uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. It's a, it's another new thing for me to get into, spend a whole bunch of money on, and then throw it all away in about five months. You, let me tell you something. You could actually you could actually get a, a set of golf clubs. For, I mean, remember I went to an auction a a, a, a couple years ago and bought an entire set of golf clubs for like twelve mm-hmm. bucks, something like that. Now I threw them away, but. I've tried golf. Uh, I went to a driving range there in uh, uh, between St. Yeah, Albans the old and your Jeans house. Greens. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's still there, yeah. isn't it? Uh, and uh, I humiliated myself in front of the chick and all my <laughs> friends. And so I was like, "Well, I'm done with this sport." And previously, I had played up at Ogilby at their golf course and humiliated myself there as well. Well, so, golf yeah. is golf is I one just, of those things that you can't just you know walk walk on there and be good. It really does take it takes right. a long, long time. And um, and so, uh, but you know, it seems like something a lot like Eido, where it's a very individualized sport. You know, I can work out the kinks at my own pace. So, um, I'm looking yeah. forward to it. I'll keep you updated, especially if we play another golf game here on the show. You know, the Brent uh, was a, I wouldn't say avid golfer, but golfed a lot in high school and had lessons and stuff. I mean, you guys, to, I'm begging you guys to go out and do some bits on the golf course with the camera. That, that would, would be, be good. Gold. I was not that. aware of that. I, I didn't know because yeah. I've, I've gone out and played several times with various people and Brent has never piped up and said, hey, I played golf. So Yeah, Brent played golf for a long time. You know, the park there, Shawnee, he used to go take That's lessons fantastic. there. That's yeah. fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah, man. Um, 
Well, Aaron, why don't we get into what's been going on this week over at our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash everything, uh, or I'm sorry, Amigos Retro Gaming. There you go. So uh, not a not a ton going on this week, but a few things we want to touch on. And I think we may have, uh, we touched on this last week during the show, and, and uh, we stuck it up this week. If, if you're into wrestling at all, uh, me and Boat had a discussion on the passing uh, of Mr. Wrestling 2 last week, who was my favorite wrestler when I was a kid. And a little fifteen-minute uh, rant. It's a I eulogy. Went on, or it's whatever. a eulogy. It's a tribute. A eulogy. That's right. A eul a tribute. I do love wrestling too. And I will say, I was so glad you recorded that and put it up. That was nice of you because I I uh, some of my wrestling buddies went and watched that and told me they really enjoyed it. So I felt I, that's all I need to yeah. know, man. When, I, when Hose gave me the thumbs up, I felt like I've accomplished something because he's he mm. knows it all. Um, I uh, you know I did a live stream last week. Both you did. Two. Has become your custom. I did. Yeah, and then I actually transferred this one over to YouTube because it was so much fun. And that was Amigo Aaron's Friday Night TRS-80 Color Computer Gamerama. Yeah. Uh, it was all color computer all the time uh, last week as I delved into the game uh, side of the uh, TRS-80. Had a lot of fun and played some games I've never even heard of, Boat. L. Curtis Boyle was in the house to uh, as, act as my guide. Uh, into this fun, wonderful world of the TRA City Color Computer, and I had a great time. And I was also using that as a uh, as as research for my upcoming project, which I'm still working on. So that helped. But we had a real good time. Had a pretty good turnout. So if you just want to watch a laid back uh, uh, stream, there you go. And I'll we'll say I'll probably be doing another one tonight. I think tonight we may do Atari Computer. Awesome! Stream, I can't but, wait. Uh, might be tonight on tonight's uh, gimmick. Um, last week. Uh, boat ARG presents uh, had a doozy. We did games about the underground, and I don't mean spray painting or skateboard. And I'm talking about games under the mm. earth. Uh, and we looked at a couple that I have to say I never heard of. I may have heard of mine, but I never played it, and I'd certainly never heard of Brent's. We looked at uh, O'Reilly's mine on the C64, and already the Aardvark. Uh, on the Apple too. I don't know. I, you watched this show, but what did you think of the uh, news that Artie the Aardvark was actually done by the guy that did the arcade version? Of well, you know, that. it's it's funny because uh, you know the uh, I guess it, like you were talking about on the show, it's like, well, why didn't they just get the arcade license? And I think the answer <laughs> is is that you know, the, the arcade, you know, the name itself, Ant Eater, is so generic in a way that it really doesn't matter what you call this game. People are going to know exactly what's going on as soon as they start playing it. It's not like, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like, I don't know that sales of Sailor Man were really hurt by it not be calling, you know, being called Popeye. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the funny thing is, the, you know, Ant Eater is a funny game. And you're right, it is sort of a generic name. And I, again, I didn't know how big a hit it was. Uh, I guess it wasn't a super big hit, but it's one of those games that everyone still remembers. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's not like Su it's not like Mr. Deuce Castle or something where it's real right. obscure. I mean, people remember this game; they remember how to play it. They were and everyone seems to remember it fondly. So maybe they just what didn't want to pay mm -hmm. the bucks, but it was still. The, I will say the guy's version was top shelf. He did a great job at that one. So if you're into that sort of thing, uh, check a out ARG. And big ups uh, to they, the Brent. This is really the part. The first thing I do whenever I watch ARG is skip right to the end because this is the this well, is the this is the best part of the show. Every week, uh, Brent produces a brand new classic arcade based video with all of the Anchor.fm supporters, and man, this thing is a feat of uh, of, of of video production. Very well done, Brent. Very well done. I always laugh because. You know, we we has to do it every week. He does it whenever we get a new one. He'll produce a new one. You know, and so uh, if we get a new supporter on Anchor, uh, uh, I get a message from Brent like, "Well, time to make a new video." <laughs> <laughs> like, he reminds me of the time to make a donuts guy, but he does it with joy. And he, I got to give the Brent credit. He's a he is a creative individual. He got all the creative genes. Um, Lastly, well, I, I should mention that that uh, in, in line with the Underground Game episode of ARG, uh, I put out a video of just uh, a bunch of games that you play underground. Just, it's just There's no commentary. I just stuck it up there just because I'd put it together. And then lastly, um, on, on YouTube anyway, uh, me and the Brent had an uh, impromptu discussion on some of the new 1UP arcade cabinets that are coming out. 
uh, both they've got some interesting stuff that's coming out, uh, uh, and, and including a game, uh, one of those deer, you know, one of those games where you mm-hmm. shoot, you know, hunt the yeah, hunting yeah. games. And it's it's like three or four of those things in one. Not bad. I mean, if the price is right, I kind I kind of like I could kind of. I really that, like they, you know? they're they're selling one that they're not they're not releasing it through retail. You can only buy it through their site. But it's a great selection of games. It's the Burger Time Cabinet, which is one of my all time favorite cabinets because I love the cutout what, side does art. Does have the hat? Is the hat yep, outlined? Yep, it's like exactly it's right. Oh, it's okay. exactly right. It looks so good. It's right. that. Yeah, that's a great Crazy cabinet. Climber and Karate Champ. And I think one other game. Odd yeah, but I mean, those are all great wow. games, you know. So uh, I, it's odd that they so it's got two joysticks. It's that that's a that is a weird assortment yeah. of games. But those are good yeah. games, you know. Crazy Clover. Who thought you'd ever see that? I wonder why they didn't put the sequel in there too, because it was really um, good too. Yeah, this is. Uh, I'll show you what it looks like real quick. If you're watching on the video, so you got Burger Time. Oh, Isn't that is nice hate, looking? Yeah. Burger Time, Karate yeah, Champ, nice. Caveman Ninja. Bad dudes. Oh. It's like they made this just for oh, you, bad Aaron. Dudes. Holy! <laughs> <laughs> no, Brent. I, 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 Brent may be getting this for his wife for Christmas. You better. Stay it's got two <laughs> sets of dual joysticks, which I guess you need, you know, for Karate Champ. But this looks so cool. I love the fact that they they didn't just square it off. They made it just like the original cabinet. The outline of his hat makes the outline of the machine very snazzy yeah. looking machine for sure. My my buddy in uh, Charleston, one of, one of our arcade buddies, he has a Burger Time. And uh, it is a glorious looking machine, and of course, Burger Time a mm-hmm. great game uh, as well. So, uh, but we chatted about that for a while. I mean, it, you talk about uh, we were just finding out about this stuff, and that's what prompted the chat. So now that's all we've got on YouTube this week. But I think, Bo, you did you streamed a couple things on Twitch. This yeah, week, I, I streamed I Elite. I would recommend you not. Which I, I would recommend that. you not watch it. It's just me getting increasingly more and more frustrated. <laughs> yeah, that's I'll, that's what I like. Those are my favorite <laughs> ones, right there. So because you're trying desperately to make it fun, make it entertaining, and it just you just keep getting killed. I love I love all the games when that happens. When I watch you play something you like, it's so fun. I want to see. And the people in the chat room are trying desperately yeah. to help you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that that is the, uh, the if you want to watch that, go for it. Uh, and uh, yeah, and yeah. also, we would be remiss if we didn't mention the Amigos High Score Challenge, which is still going on. If you're watching the video version of the show, you can see the full leaderboard. Um, but uh, and the we've got one more week to submit your high scores if you are a Discord uh, Discord member. Uh, and uh, right now, Retro Algae is in first place with an eye watering <laughs> score of uh, yeah. six uh, seven hundred and sixty three thousand four hundred. It's more almost double the second place. So you know, it's funny because I, I actually have played. Uh, I haven't submitted a score yet, but I can tell you it's not going to be in that. It's going to be very low. Uh, and when I saw that score pop up, it didn't exactly light a fire <laughs> for me. I was like, "Oh, this is not my cup of tea." But I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it. Well, the as try. you know from participating in the Coco High Score Challenge, also, usually yeah, not my there cup of are tea. people that are just uh, phenomenal at these games, and you can't, you can't yeah. hope to best them. All you can hope is to give it your best shot. But I had a lot of fun. I will tell you that this has inspired me to play about 400 million times more Bubble Bobble than I ordinarily would have. And, of course, we'll give you the full Bubble Bobble rundown when we cover it on the show next week and we crown the champion of the Amigos High Score Challenge. Again, if you support us on Patreon for as little as $1 a month, you can get access to our Discord server and participate in the Amigos High Score Challenge. Very good. That's all I got. All right. Well, let's talk about this week's Amiga news. And I've I've neglected, if you're watching the video, I've neglected to add the spinning boing ball and the side updates graphics because they were on my earlier drive that I recently swapped out and I haven't just reestablished the file paths yet. So if you were wondering where the gamble train was, don't worry. He's he's having some work done on the undercarriage, if you know what I'm saying. And so uh, yeah. he will be back next week. Uh, but for right now, we'll just have the Amiga News robot bring us the news. Amiga News, the, the fake, fake robot. robot. So first up, out of the gate, Retro Man Cave is back with a new video, the Amiga 4000. This is the Trash to Treasure Part 2, where he goes over some yeah. more of the history of the Amiga 4000. Talks about you know what a lost, monumental failure of an opportunity that AGA graphics were. How everybody was just so sad that that got slapped into that machine and ruined the the promise of the the AAA chipset. And then after that, he goes into it and he talks about how he uh, replaced the PSU. I don't know if you saw this, Aaron. 
Oh, I watched it. I've got a lot to say well, about it. Okay, this. say it. You know, th- uh, Neil ventured uh, uh, into my territory mm. here. It's called some baloney <laughs> tech. I loved it. When he said that the... Now, I will say this, to be upfront about it, if because if, he said at the beginning of this, he goes, listen, this power supply is probably okay, but I'm going to do something anyway. If that right there, I mm-hmm. would not have done something. But if everything after that was right up my alley, gutting the old power supply, haphazardly slipping in a new power <laughs> supply, screwing it in, that's my cup of tea right there. I gave him the big thumbs up. I wrote him a message. I was like, that's exactly the way I... Just a bunch, because he. And what I like is he. He had someone, uh, or maybe he did it. So he three D printed this mm-hmm. plate. But now he's like, nah, nah, that's no good. Because he could have used yeah. that, but he had to gut the old power supply and then put mm-hmm. the new one in it. That's my kind yeah. of baloney, Neil. I salute Absolutely. You. The sketchy tech is please. So anyway, if you are a fan of the Amiga four thousand and a fan of smooth, sultry voices, which I mean, who isn't? Definitely check out this week's. Retro Man KVD, and he actually has an even newer one that just went up, but we'll talk about that next week. Yeah. All right, Aaron. Next up, Mr. Pleasance, as you call him. Ha- yes, you must say has, Mr. Has He's released a new book. Uh, no, I'm sorry, is in the process of releasing what? a new book. This is a new yes. Kickstarter. Uh, Kickstarter, this is called From Vultures to Vampires, Commodore Amiga, 25 Years of Copyright Chaos and Technology Triumphs. Uh David is writing this book in conjunction with Trevor Dickinson. Uh, Trevor, if you are unaware, is the founder of the Next Gen Amiga platform, the Aeon. I'm never quite sure how to say that. The big, the Close new enough. big box Amigas that are bespoke machines that have all custom stuff in them and are incredibly expensive but look kind of cool. Um, of course, everything with the Amiga, even the new machines, it's oh, all yeah. going to Oh, yeah. So, um, anyway, uh, they're writing this book together. I guess this is really going to focus on the copyright uh, and, uh, you know, corporate side of things. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sort of a fascinating story. I know uh, our buddy Ravi is doing a video series about this same time period with ESCOM and all that stuff. So, uh, this, yeah. this would be, yeah, That'd this be is a sort of a compliment to that. Uh, this book is halfway towards its goal. They've reached, uh, they've uh, raised 15000 of the 31,000 needed to publish this book. Uh, there is still one month to go, though, so you still have plenty of time if you want to jump on board. There's a couple of good uh, Amiga-related Kickstarters. There's that one. There's also the one our buddies mm-hmm. got up uh, with the right. keyboards. Don't forget about mm-hmm. that one. If you're still uh, if you're still on the fence about it, go in and kick in on that. Uh, that is a uh, that looks pretty good. And as for Mr. Pleasance, I don't know if you caught. Uh, he was on a, a Amiga Bill. Oh, had a, I saw you. I saw him. you watch it. Give us the rundown on, on what that was like. Well, I'll tell you something, and you know me, Boat. <laughs> uh, I don't even care what people are talking about as long as it is mm-hmm. amusing. And Mr. Pleasance is the kind of guy that I would like to run into at like oh, a yeah. bar, and like early mm-hmm. in the night, and then just let turn him on by the few you would have you would have loved gone. him at Amiga Ireland because that's exactly yeah. what he did. He sat there with his pints and he would just tell yeah. stories. You know, he used to be a professional flamingo guitarist. Yeah, I've heard all kinds. Yeah, he's, he's done, done it all. So, and I, I and so, but I mean, he's my kind of. You know, listen, I know a little something about an old dude who just sits around <laughs> ranting for two or hours or more. That's me. And and Mister Pleasance is is like uh, great at it. Now he would he was telling Bill uh, uh, and the guys over there at Guru he was telling uh, and of course everybody in chat all these crazy tales about how he came to Commodore and the stuff he did before Commodore and I mean some of this stuff is probably well trodden ground but it doesn't matter he says it great I enjoyed it uh, I I uh, uh, I don't know if everything he said was one hundred percent on the on the mm-hmm. on the dot but I, I didn't fact check him. Uh, but uh, it was amusing. He's an amusing well, I character. Well, sort of, you know, and, w- and, and maybe this is sacrilege, but whenever people like that are talking, uh, I almost view it as, as, as sort of a, you know, it's your, it's, your, it's your typical old dude. He's spinning up some yarns. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but as long as it's entertaining, that's what I care about. Now, I know that there are lots of Amiga historians out there that would definitely take umbrage to that, but for me, yeah. I'm in it for the entertainment, baby. You know, uh, there's a lot of rest- old wrestlers. All right, and you're very right there. Every one of them has been in a riot because he did something in the ring. They've all sold out in Madison Square <laughs> Garden. You know what I'm saying? Now they've all right. done these things. Now that's mm-hmm. their story. If you look too close, eh, you don't. You, know, you don't want to look not. too close. That's the thing. Yeah, that's right. But uh, you know, still, 
uh, I think Mr. Putz is, is, is an amusing character. He will never run out of speaking no, engagements. Let's no, put it that no. way. All right. Next on the docket, and finally, we have a article from Hackaday that was released a couple of days ago, and it's uh, this is uh, it, it basically answers the the same old questions that the week that come up from time to time. But Hackaday is a pretty big site, so I wanted to bring this to everybody's attention. Uh, why you probably won't be building a replica Amiga anytime soon, and he contrasts this with the Commodore sixty four. I guess the Commodore sixty four you can actually build one out of entirely bespoke parts. You can get a new injection yep. molded case every all of the parts have been replicated at this point and he talks about because of the complexity of the boards the custom chipsets etc uh it, and the, obviously the low amount of demand compared to a system like the c64 it is not on the yep. cards as of right yet well the custom chips are the thing they don't make them uh and i believe Commodore owned the place that made uh, uh, those customized chips. Come one, th one of the things they did back in the day at Commodore was they they would buy, they would buy the people that did the work for them. Because uh, in fact, I know for certain the people that did the plastics for the CC4, they just stopped paying them until they went broke wow. and they bought them, as I recall. So, and they, uh, but they also owned the chip place too. Uh, I did, I saw this article. I read through it. Uh, you know, uh, I think. I think the day will come where you could sort of build one like that. But I mean, uh, I mean, the guy's not wrong. A, a lot of those old computers and consoles were built off the shelf, by, you know, entirely. Mm -hmm. And that's why you can get away with it. That's what made, that's what, and the article mentions this, that's what made the Amiga special. Right. You know, they didn't should take a bunch of parts and just cobble them together into a new thing. This is a, this is new stuff. It's, it, it the, the chips were special, mm -hmm. you know, and so there you go. So uh, there's going to be a time, we've mentioned this years ago, there's going to be a time where you can't get these parts anymore and the parts that are available have went, turned to dust or, or, or went by the wayside. And so we're all going to have to just set the <laughs> move on or, or get some, some, you know, an FPGA or something. I mean, that time's not today. Maybe it won't be in 50 years, but I mean, when you can't get them anymore, I don't see there's, the Amiga community is not large enough to where someone's going to go back in and replicate all those chips and go pay someone to make them or anything. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that, eh. that's going to do it for this week's Amiga news. Um, and, uh, but a little bit of a slow week, but I'm sure we'll be back with a vengeance in next week. But Aaron, I'm glad it was a slow news week because we got a lot to talk about this yeah. week's game. Let's talk about Elite. You know, this is one of those games. In fact, even more than Frontier when we did it. And I, gosh, how many hunt was it a hundred episodes ago or something where we looked at Elite Two? It seems it was like a while, it, it was a while back. Uh, I have I didn't know, I'd forgotten about this game, frankly. Uh, I mean, I just because we didn't cover it, and then when it popped up, I'm like, oh boy, here we go, because these games, some of these games can be very intimidating. And this game could be intimidating, but I'm going to tell you why it didn't intimidate me after I started playing it when we get into it. Uh, and both now, surely somewhere in your past, you've come across the Elite uh, uh, on on one of your systems. Have you ever played well, this one before this week? To tell you the truth, uh, Elite was always a game that I read about. I've been reading about Elite for literally decades. The, I think made, yeah. the first uh, issue of Retro Gamer that I ever bought off the newsstand in like 2004 had a story about Elite in it, and that's. For a long, for the longest time, that's that's what I knew about Elite was it was this space, it was this crazy open world space game that people in Europe played. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Um, and this is one of those games that I usually give my disclaimer, and I'll give it again. The we were actually tipped off on this a, a couple weeks ago, uh, at least I was, and so I had some extra time to play it. But this a game like this, uh, the subtleties of certain trade routes and and well, who to sell what to where and stuff are probably going to be lost on us. If, and if those are, those are the things you enjoy, you probably... I have no deep <laughs> Don't look to us for any game-winning game right. tips on Elite. That's right. That's right, Bo. So, you know, uh, 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 this is just our take on it. So, Elite uh, debuted on the Amiga in 88. Mm -hmm. Now, this game had been out for quite a while uh, before it came to the Amiga, uh, I believe it, it released in 84 uh, on, I think it was the BBC Micro, and that was the, that was your uh, number one uh, version. And it was, when it came out, they were, uh, the people that even made the computer were baffled that this game could even exist. That's a mm -hmm. quote. 
they're like, how could this even be on our on our little right. computer here? I, I think the original and, uh, was squeezed. The the cassette version was squeezed into something like 16k or 32k. Very very small game for the scope of what is involved here. Absolutely, and I remember thinking, I was you know, uh, even I, it's funny before we ever did this show, and I, I was talking to you about the Amiga. And I remember bringing up the fact that this game and the second game were smushed down. To where they were on, I mean, it's, it was always amazing to me that they could fit this much content on a single Especially floppy. Especially when you look disc. at all the dirt worst games that come on seven or eight floppies, and you're like, "What are you doing yeah. with all this space?" <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. Now, granted, there's no, di there's not a lot of digitized speech or FMV. No, not a lot. This, but, not a lot. <laughs> so, um, again, this came out in '88, uh, published by Firebird, and uh, was a uh, was a game that was. Uh, Developed by an outfit called Mr. Micro. Yeah. No, I, Mr. I'm, uh, I, I've been waiting all week for you to tell me more about Mr. Micro because that pops up big. I, I want to say that the Mr. Micro logo is almost bigger than the Elite logo when you fire this thing up. <laughs> well, I'm going to get into why the developer probably was proud of it and put his uh, uh, logo up there so prominently. Uh, Mr. Micro, the developer, didn't do a ton of stuff on the uh, on the Amiga. They did Pac Land, which I, I've always heard Pac Land. I believe it was Pac Land was. It's a it it's a very well good phrased. port. I've played it on the Amiga. I, I've not played it. They did a game called Star Blaze and Treble Champions. That sounds like something you can mm -hmm. shoot into, Boat. Um, the coder on this was Gary Patchen and Rob Nicholson. Uh, this was their only effort. And the music on this was done by, and I wanted to bring this up, Wally Beban. And, uh, and amongst the musical... Uh, Offerings from him on the Amiga. Well, he did the music at Do Run. Really, Run, Wally but... Beeman? Isn't yeah. that? Uh, yeah. What's What's Willie Beamish? Willie yeah. Beamish. Yeah, that, that's, that's a, a different that's thing, right? Yeah. Uh, Wally also he did. Wally did a ton of music, including Driller, Pools of Radiance, uh, the uh, Gold Box game, SDI, Superman, uh, and the original creators of Elite way back in the day were uh, David Braben and mm -hmm. Ian Bell. Uh, now, <laughs> these guys actually did a couple things on the Amiga. Uh, Con they did Conqueror. Uh, Braben did Conqueror, Elite 2, and Virus. But uh, the other guy did the stuff I'm really interested in, Ian Bell. He did a series of games starring Charlie Chimp. Have you ever no, heard of these games? No. <laughs> Charlie Chimp. There were five I Charlie Chimp games. I do love Chimp a good games. Chimp in a suit, though. Mm -hmm. I do, too. Uh, and uh, he did a game called Kingdoms of Steam mm. as well. Uh, this game uh, runs on the old OCS, no problem there. Now, I'm going to just sprint through these conversions, folks, because this is one of your all-time okay. kings, all right? You got the Acorn Archimedes, our personal favorite. You got your Amstrads, the Apple II, the 2GS, the Atari ST, which I've been told the Amiga and the Atari ST versions are very similar. Uh, you got your BBC Micro, the Master, the uh, Micro Tube, the Micro Electron, the C64, uh, the Sam Coupe, or Coupe, if you will. The MSX, the NEC PC-98, the NES yep. boat. Yes, Did you know I played that? it. Uh, oh, oh, I want to hear about that. DOS, the Spectrum, uh, the 128 Spectrum, the 48 uh, Spectrum, the Einstein. Patoon. <laughs> yeah, so these were all, and then there were a ton of unofficial ports I'm not going to get into. But this thing was everywhere. This is like the Dragon's Lair of space flight <laughs> simulators. It appeared on everything all the time. Now, before we get into this deeply, unless you want to save it for later, can you give me a brief synopsis of how this plays on the NES? Um, this was a well, Famicom I, I game. Well, I think it would right? work out if we did that a little bit after we after we. Did okay, it. fair enough. Fair, fair enough. I'm dying to hear that. So, what is this game? Well, when you open a box for this bad boy back in the day, you were you you came a with novella. a novella. This was one of one of the many yeah. Amiga games that came with a novella. Well, I think yeah, that's kind of I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm know. for it, except for the fact that when we play it through emulation, it doesn't come with a novella. Yeah, uh, this game. Well, I mean, you, the, it was out there. It was called the the, the novella was called the Dark mm -hmm. Wheel. It was a uh, it was by Robert Holdstock. And uh, according to the wiki, I haven't read this, but it says that the uh, book gave the uh, player insight into the moral and legal codes to which they might ex aspire. Which that's pretty deep stuff. For, uh, it was well, deeper this than is, I this got is, into. This comes again that. from an, and it's it's funny. Um, there is uh, if you watch Kim Justice's uh, video on this, she goes into there's a whole sort of subculture of people out there that want to read political 
meanings into games. And so, and this, and this was yeah. of the time when people were starting to do that. And, uh, and I guess that there is a, from what, what people say, there is a real libertarian streak in Elite, believe it or not. Of course, a game where you can trade slaves and whatever you want on the open market. That does sound very, Dark yeah, very, Onyx. very libertarian. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, mm. guns, weapons. So, uh, the, uh, the novella, from what I was able to ascertain, it talks about this guy whose father left him a ship and, uh, the guy kind of tools around in it and eventually realizes his father's place in the universe, goes to avenge him. You know, that's what the book's about. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Sounds yeah. like my kind of book. Um, the guys that made this game said they were inspired by a whole slew of space-related stuff. Uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and Star Wars, Star Trek, all the normal stuff mm -hmm. you would expect. Uh, so this game, to me, this game is the answer to the question. Nobody had. Uh, oh. What happened? You know, the question is, what would happen if you took Space Dynasty or Star Traders and just made a, a visual game out of it. It, it. This is sort of what you would get in a lot of ways. Uh, this, the, the, the closest game to me th that this plays like is one of the old BBS door games, uh, specifically uh, Trade Wars, a game where you, guess what, fly a spaceship around a vast universe trading and fighting uh, other ships. I know, pretty st <laughs> it's not like It's not a new concept, but that's, that's basically what it is. Uh, you start off I believe it's the Cobra Three, and uh, a lot of the ships in this are like are are named after like reptiles yeah. and snakes, and you and you start off in, in dock, and you can pretty much go and do what you want. I mean, uh, literally, you can do pretty much anything you want. Uh, you can uh, pick up what you should do is, is pick yourself up some cargo, and then go try to make yourself a buck. You start off with a hundred credits, uh, and 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 a, and a wing and a prayer. And then from that point, you are you can take off f from the planet and and go out and try to uh, make some bucks. And how do you make some bucks? Well, you navigate the, first the local systems. You try to go to other places that you can sell what you are buying at a better at a better turnover. Uh, you can even look and see what people have a lot of and what they don't have a lot of. And you can sort of, if you're a clever person, you can make up a plan, which I'm not well, that clever. Well, you don't necessarily have to be clever. You have to be someone with a heck of a lot of time on their hands. That, well, that's one of the things about this game. And uh, uh, you'll recall there was a massively multiplayer game, uh, I think it was Eve, that I know was heavily, uh, heavily influenced mm -hmm. by this game. And I remember my, my brother and his friends playing this game, and he was telling me, he's like, listen, this game, it's so slow that they put they put a web browser in the game so you could do something else while mm -hmm. you're sitting there. And I remember I asked them, because they would play this for hours and hours, I was like, why do you sit there and just watch the stars go by for hours? You know? And he's like, well, this it's, it's relaxing. Yeah, well, I, I you know, think another thing about Eve, too, because I, I fell under the spell of Eve for a time, the fact that it is entirely, much more so than EQ or WoW, player run. I mean, the, the entire, yeah. everything about it is player run. Uh, I, everybody's read the the classic tale of the the time that the whole like major corporation was overrun by these. Uh, the stories of Eve are so much more exciting than actually the playing of Eve. <laughs> Especially yes, if you are yes, a no-name exactly. loser like I was. <laughs> <laughs> Ultima Online was yeah, like that yeah. too. It's like, wow, they over they killed Lord British. Well, yeah, they did, or they had this now. I mean, yeah, it's kind of neat, but I mean, when you play that game, I never thought it was that good. Um, the the uh, universe of Elite is vast. Uh, you've got eight galaxies. Uh, each of the galaxies, according to the wiki, have two hundred and fifty six planets. They're procedurally generated uh, planets, and you, uh, it's uh, this is one of those games where you feel every one of those planets. <laughs> Uh, it is a vast, vast, vast universe, and you could literally fly around forever and not. If you just wanted to put the thing on full speed and pick a direction, like uh, Picard said, you know, uh, at the end of Star Trek, you could just drive mm -hmm. on forever and not run into anything, except for pirates, which you'll run into uh, mm -hmm. quite often. Uh, but uh, it's that kind of game. So this is one of those games where if you're going to want to get into it. You're gonna to want to be the kind of person that gets into games like this, right? You know what yeah, I'm saying, Bo? Absolutely. Um, now, uh, the the concepts are pretty good. Some of the things you can do when you're in space are actually fight stuff. Uh, often you'll get jumped by pirates, or you could just jump somebody else if you take the notion. Now, if you do, if you do that too often, you'll get a you'll get a basically a mm -hmm. bad rep 
effectively in the game. And but you could also go out and kill pirates to get sort of a good rep. So you know it's a it's a mixed bag there. Um, the problem. Let's just get into things. I, I, mean, I like all that stuff, and I like these sorts of games to a point. All right. The problem I had with this game right out of the gate was um, this is one of those games that you need to that you need a full freaking like spiral binder that you need. This is one of those games you buy the game and you take that binder into the can boat. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And you read this thing. You mm -hmm. read a lot as you're trying to figure out what in God's name you're doing. Well I, I, I flipped through the instructions. I printed out a, a handy quick guy with the keys and stuff. Uh, but I mean, there are there, there's a lot going on in this game, that, and there's but at the same time, right? There's not it a lot is. It's on. it's very 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 different than Elite Two in so many ways. I was really expecting Elite One to be just like a mini Elite Two, like it's like Elite Two but scaled back. But this thing is so far removed in terms of the simplicity of the mechanics and what you can do. Like, let's just start from the beginning. So in Elite yeah. 2, you actually have to control your launch from, like, if you're on a planet, first of all, you can land on a planet in Elite, you can't, or in Elite 2, you can't land on a planet in Elite. Yeah. Um, in yeah. You, uh, in this game, you land on space stations, and when you launch, you're just back out in space. Like, you, you don't actually yeah. control the launch sequence itself. Now, you do have to dock. That That is always, yeah, that is cool. always going to be part of Elite. But once oh, we'll you're in that. space... The controls are very, very simple. You can either roll four or you can roll one way or roll the other way, accelerate and reverse. There's no, I think it's pitch and yaw are the technical terms. There's none of that in Elite. So the actually controlling your ship is a little bit easier than it is in Elite 2. Does that make docking easier? No. Um, the trading aspect of the game is pretty much the same. And where Elite really falls apart for me and a lot of other people, and this goes all the way up through Elite Dangerous, is at the end of it, it's just comparing numbers. It's like, okay, well this, you know, I can buy this good for this much here, and I can go to this other place and I can sell it for more, and I can make money, and I can repeat that until I die. And along the way, you get a lot of money and you make more you, you, you make more ship upgrades. But at the end of the day, there's not an overarching story and it's by design. You know, these games are by design not to have an overarching story. Now, in Elite, uh, in the newer games, they've tried to finagle ways that you can gain influence with certain factions or other factions and that develop, you can develop your standing. But really, the end game in Elite is just to increase your rank in whatever rank that you want. You can either, you know, be a uh, space pirate killer, and you can become an elite. In, you can become elite in combat. You can become elite in trading, and there are many different. You go through harmless, mostly harmless, you know, a little bit dangerous, all the way up to elite. And so, um, that's really the the end game. But the thing that I think most people that played elite really appreciated about the game was not the, the the tireless quest to become elite. It was the sense of freedom that the game afforded you. Now, before we go on, we should talk a little bit about what makes the Amiga version graphically different than the other versions of the game, because the Amiga version does have a unique look. It looks different than any other port of this game. And one of the things that the Braven and Bell did was that they, you know, in turn, and when they went to license out Elite, they basically just said, okay, well, we made this version. You guys can make whatever version you want. And that's what people did. And that's why you get such a, such a big difference in the way these games look. Uh, the Amiga version has polygonal graphics versus the Spectrum and the original uh, BBC Micro graphics are all wireframe. So if you can imagine playing, um, you know, Elite on a Vectrex, it wouldn't look much different than it does on the BBC Micro. And the, and, uh, the Amiga version, they're very nice looking polygonal graphics, especially for the time for 88. I thought that the, the polygonal graphics look pretty good. Um, the gauge cluster looks mostly the same. The radar uh, looks the same, the compass. I really think the genius in Elite lies in the radar system and it's so it's it's so good that it hasn't changed. The way that your ship and the things around you are displayed in Elite looks exactly the same as what the, the, the radar system looks like in Elite Dangerous. I mean, it's so good that they never found the need to change it. So that was there from the get-go, which surprised me. I didn't realize that that was gonna be the case. Um, the things that I don't like about this game are mostly the fact that um, 
it it's not very intuitive once you do get into space uh, how to find your, the next place that you want to go because unless the unless you want to blow up some pirate ships, which is fine, eventually you're going to have to land because you're going to run out of fuel. What you have to do is you have to wait for the S to appear in your radar, and then when that S appears, the what uh, your compass, which is the thing to the upper right uh, in your display, it goes from displaying the nearest planet to displaying the space station. However, the icon in the middle of the compass itself doesn't change. And to me, that would be the one, if I could change one thing about this game, because there's a lot to really laud, especially for a game this old. Um, if they would have made the, this, the, the shape in the compass change to that, uh, the decahedron, I think is what it is, the, the, the space, uh, space station, or at least change the color or something, or maybe they did, they didn't make that very apparent, and I found that incredibly frustrating, because all I wanted to do was land so I could buy some stuff. Another thing that they, they, they didn't do in this version, but they did in some of the versions, was they make you buy the docking computer, and money does not come easy early on in this game, or really any of the Elite games. You have to really work yeah. to make some dough, and the docking computer is not cheap, and the docking computer, by all accounts, makes this game so much more fun because docking is a heck of a chore, especially in this early version of Elite where you don't have the micro controls that you do in the later versions. Well, just to backtrack on some of that stuff, yes. Uh, you know, everyone should have, think about this. You run a space station, all right? Are you going to let some clumsy idiot come in there you i would be paying for them to yeah. have the docking yeah. computer you know what i mean because without that you're just ramming the side of the space station I, that was listen I, i'm gonna go back on some station i don't agree with you about the graphics i didn't think they were really? good at all uh no i don't what, think what that would good. you do to make them better uh, i think i'd number one i think i'd rather that rather be wireframe frankly uh when you're fighting enemies they come in looking like asteroids just round balls and you only have you have to get real close to even see what well, the yeah, heck you're looking at. Well, yeah, but that's the same with the wireframe graphics too. You think there's wireframe I, graphics I scaled? Come on, man. I think the Amiga could do better in '88. That's what I no think. way. I think that no way. In '88, sure they could. I think the colors they used are, to say the least, I, garish. I'll so give you that. It, it, I'll give you that. I don't know. It, it looks, looks like the freaking Shadow whoever, of the Beast sky displayed yeah, no, in, in 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 gauges. Well, I mean, it, it's almost like the Joker had a hand in designing the spaceship. It looks green and purple. It's like, what? what is this all about? I don't like those either. Um, you talked about the guys porting this over, and they're just like, yeah, just do whatever you want. That wasn't something people wanted. I read the guys that programmed this were like, yeah, they wouldn't give us the source mm -hmm. code. They wouldn't give us Jack Squad. We, all we did was the, <laughs> they gave us uh, algorithms that we needed for certain things. The guys, and they gave us the, what the ships looked like. That seems like an unnecessary burden to get. You. <laughs> it seems like you would want to provide, right? Especially because you're you're the one needed. that's going to be making the money off yeah. this thing. When I read that, I was like, "This is nonsense." Because what if you? And we've seen well, stuff. I'll that tell can you. Burn I'll tell you what would happen. This is what I suspect: is that you get a lot of the Tom mixes of the world out there that get their hands on the source code, and then you have Bullet. <laughs> you know. And well, listen. Hey, Tom Mix does it better than a lot of people. We think well, about yeah. it. But. Uh, 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 the, the truth of the matter is, uh, I'm not saying these guys did a bad job. I'm just saying that's an odd way to do business. In my, it, it put a lot of undue pressure on the guys that were asked to convert this over. Um, I don't, uh, I don't really uh, like the controls either. To be honest with you, I tried. I played this on my Amiga. I played this on my PC. I tried joystick and gamepad and the mouse, and I didn't like the controls for any of them. I just didn't. I, it seems like I had a heck of a time wheeling around. Everything just, I said, I could not make my ship do what I wanted. Uh, part of that's because I'm not very good, I guess, but it wasn't fun. The combat I found uh, exceedingly difficult uh, to to be any well, good it's definitely, at. Yeah, it's I, also, I would it's, say it's, it's definitely more complex than Wings, but it's less complex yeah. than Elite 2. Well, they... Oh, I mean, Elite 2, I'm even, I control the ship better well, than I do got, Yeah, and being able to control the ship with the mouse in Elite 2 is, is heavenly compared to this. You can control but with it the mouse in this, But it doesn't too. work the same way. Yeah. No, it sucks. All, I didn't like it with keyboard. I use the keyboard most of the time. Um, that, so speaking of the combat, like, you can't go anywhere without a pirate up your butt. Everywhere you go. Uh, I, when it makes it, when you're starting out and your ship is uh, the USS soon to be murdered, every, you need mm -hmm. a break. This is but these games were hard. They did they they uh, uh, punished ignorance. They did not like you. They did not want mm -hmm. you to succeed. 
And it, so this is the this is the Shadow the Beast of the three D space no, flight world in terms that, that, of difficulty. No, difficulty, I, it, you can it's hard. you can get you can get around. I don't know. I think that's overly harsh. It just I would be indiscriminately killed when I thought I had a good thing going, and that drove me nuts. Just when I like I would get killed some. That's okay, but when I was finally getting a rhythm. I would just, I mean, you're getting a rhythm, and then you're, that's why I switched over to the emulator so I could have save states, because I got so tired of just starting yeah. all the way over. I didn't like it. Um, the uh, uh, the docking, that docking is, uh, whoever thought that was a good idea has lost their damn mind. I like the idea of docking, but what are we doing? You know, I hated well, they, that. <clears throat> I remember hating this when I was a kid. I was like, I was like, screw yeah. this. I can't and get my shit that. Now is a good time to talk about the, the NES version. So, uh, Braben has said, or no, Bell, I'm sorry, Bell has said that the NES version is the best 8-bit version of the game. Um, oh, no, I'm not kidding. Um, the, it was ported by, oh, I can't remember who, I think maybe Imagine or some, some place, some, some, some development company in the UK. They could not find anybody that wanted to publish it in the U.S., which I think is surprising. Um, but uh, but so it was a PAL it was PAL yeah. only release. Uh, it yeah. it plays pretty darn well. Um, the way that they get around all of the menus is that what you do is you double tap uh, or you hold down B. You've got a strip th- full of menus at the bottom of the screen. Think about like SimCity, and uh, and yeah. basically you hold down B and you move to the one that you want and you double tap B to access that menu. Now, is that as easy as using the F keys on the keyboard? No. Is it preferable to the keyboard? No. But if you are a, uh, if you don't have a keyboard, if all you have is a console, it looks really, really nice. You know, the the graphics are good. They're the wireframe graphics. Um, the uh, there's a nice little tune that plays. You know, uh, it's uh, it, it, I think the tune might get old after a while, but you can turn the music off anytime you want. Um, there are save states, multiple save slots in Elite for the NES, which shocked me because, you know, sometimes you get, like in Zelda, you get three. In this game, you got like eight slots for your commanders, which was cool. Um, and uh, all together, you know, it's, it was surprising how good it was. I was not expecting it to be that good. And the best part about it, you get the docking computer right off the bat. Now, I know that the uh-huh. Amstrad version is supposedly the best 16-bit version. Uh, I would love to have a go with the Amstrad version. It looks super nice, too. Uh, it, it looks like more like the Amiga version, but it doesn't have that really garish uh, in, in ship interior sort of HUD, which I agree with you. That looks horrible. Um, uh, I would like to give it a go. And, of course, the DOS versions also, the Unelite and all that stuff. There's that, there, that too. Yeah. Hey, when you when you do your uh, NES stream, I request that you give this a whirl okay. while you're on there. Well, I can't because I don't like have a pal mess. Oh, oh, bugger! It won't let you do that no, with the card. No. Oh, too bad. Um, so, you know, I sort of felt like I buried this a little bit. So I do, I do want to say this: this is a perfect example of a game that was revolutionary when it was released. It was still revolutionary when it was just on the Amiga, but just has has an aged well to me and for the basic reason that it's a kind of game that you would play when you had a lot of time and when this was all new to you and you've never seen a game like this now we're very spoiled boat and i i was watching your stream you were talking about how easy it was to get around in frontier and this and that and you're right everything you said was true uh but but this they were charting new territory with these games and we've covered this a few times on the show where we see a game is uh may not be our cup of tea but they were breaking new ground and at the time it was quite remarkable and this is a perfect example of that sort of game so while i i would not sit down and play a game with this today uh no way uh and even young me didn't play it but when young me played it it had been out for several years at that point and i'd already played stuff like wing commander and stuff and so I'd gotten myself spoiled, but this really was quite a an amazing accomplishment given uh, what they had to work with back in the day and what had been done previously. So that that is not lost on me. And I did notice as I was l- looking over some of the Discord reviews that that was a reoccurring mm-hmm. theme when it came to discussing this game. People were paying this game props, uh, whether they were still enjoying playing it or not. Uh, is this a kind of game? And by the way, I, when I mentioned this, reminded me of Trade Wars on the uh, BBS. Uh, games. It, it really, really had. I'm sure that had to have played into the design. Well, of I mean, game. 
It is so let's similar. Not, let's not give trade wars like they are the first person to come up with the fact that you can buy something low and sell it high somewhere else. I mean, trade wars didn't invent right, that concept. I mean, there are so many. There are so many things that they have in common. Uh, that's why it's really quite a. It, even uh, scooping stuff for the fuel and the, uh, uh, the a lot of the stuff in it. Uh, you know, you you dock at those spaceports. You do your trading. You get your equipment. All the exact same stuff is in trade wars. I'm not saying they ripped off trade wars. I'm just saying if you're if you were a fan of those, that's the reason I picked this up to begin with back right. when I was a kid. You know, or younger, I was like, man, this is like trade wars coming oh, to yeah. life. I, uh, yeah. I, I think that for a lot of people that play, they grew up playing the BBS door games. Uh, look, and, but I mean, here's the thing, though. This game came out in 84. There weren't that many people that had played the BBS door games in 84 because not that many people had modems back then, you know, especially in the UK. <laughs> Remember, it was a different world in the UK. Local... Uh, people had modems in 84, not in the, though, but not they in had the UK. Back then. You, have you ever heard people talk about how expensive it was? Even local calls cost money. Like, local calls weren't free in the UK. Well, I mean, that's that was true no, here. No, local too. calls have always been free I here could, since you've been alive. That's not that's, true. I could not call That's Charleston. not a local call. I, I remember when Huntington wasn't well, a local I mean, call either, but I'm talking about any call that yeah. you made was, yeah. Oh, you mean every right. call. Well, yeah, that's true. Um, still, I, I'd say that the, I, I'm not making any aspersions. I'm just saying they're yeah. very similar. That's all I'm saying. Um, oh, one other thing I want to mention, and I didn't know this. Either, oh, and by the way, it. Trade Wars, Frodo informs us, yeah. came out in '84, the same year that Elite did. So there goes that theory. There you go. Well, there, Trade Wars was built on the back of something similar. I'd have to look and see what, exactly the way it went down because I did a I did a write up on Trade Wars for ARG a while back, and it'd been that game had been around for a long time. Um, the uh, and I didn't know this part either, but and, but I read it. There are some missions in this that you do. I believe it was for this, like the space navy. Uh, they're they're not something you're going to come across. Yeah, that and, often. And, and, this is you not know, that and kind of that's game. what I like. In my perfect world, and this is what I wish Elite Dangerous would have done. Is like, okay, here is this whole world. The world is your oyster. You can go out and you can explore whatever you want. But if you are the sort of person that likes to be directed a little bit. Here's here's this. You can do this and you can progress. And No Man's Sky, I know No Man's Sky gets a lot of hate for the, the way that it launched and stuff, but No Man's Sky, in its current way, does a great job of that, where it's like, you can literally do whatever you want, but if you do need some direction, here's a thing that'll lead you through sort of all the main cool things in the game. So I wish Elite would have done that. You know, and I, I will admit, I'm the kind of guy that does... I need my both my hands held and a pat on the tushy mm-hmm. to get me to go anywhere in these games. I don't know no idea what I'm doing. Um... Let's talk about the uh, reception of this game before we get into the Amiga reviews of it and whatnot. Because I want to talk about this just to show you that the, the kind of uh, love that was heaped on this game. Uh, this one, the gold, and one of my favorites, Bo, the Golden Joystick oh, yes. Award, Best Original Game, 1984. It was the Crash Readers Award, Best Game Overall in 85. It was the Game of the Year in Computer Gamer for 85. Next Gen. A magazine devoted, said it was the best game of the 80s, number one. Number one, vote of the 80s. IGN was number 12 in the top 25 PC games of all times. Retro Gamer named it the number one top retro game well, yeah. of all okay. time. So, let's stop right there. If you're writing for a British <laughs> publication, you're going to put this at the top of yeah. the list every single time. Because this is your home. This is like the Union Jack for you. Or the British flag. Yeah, but Next, you, next Generation's yeah, not they a are. British I'm magazine. I'm pretty sure they're British. And then, oh, how about this, Times Online? No, the that, that's, Times, the, that's, or, that's the I'm London sure Times, Times, but good try. Okay, you're right. Okay, what about Stuff That's magazine? also That's Number also a British six. magazine. So you're saying yes, every single Yes, that's why I said British? what I said. So the Golden Joystick? No, they're an outlier. Oh, okay, there it you is. Win. I knew I'd find one here. Uh, let's talk about how this looked on the Amiga. Anyway, I guess I just want to say the game it got, got over, over very, very well in England. Same. Absolutely. Um, so... Uh, the lemon people give this an 8.4 4 yeah pretty good yeah. um uh, ace gave this a uh 918 whatever that is uh we've got uh, amiga computing gave it a 96 amiga format gave it an 86 some of these scores are going to surprise you amiga power 73 uh um, uh a u i gave this a uh 6 out of 10 uh, Commodore user gave it an 83%, and the one gave this an 85 And your Amiga gave this a 65 Yeah, They killed this well, game. Now, mm-hmm. I looked at a, 
a lot of these reviews were I read them, and uh, they were they were just sort of I was surprised that they just didn't get it. They weren't into it, and I, it, you know, you'd think so. This wasn't necessarily well received on the Amiga like it was on other on other places. Well, apparently. I think you know, in a way that what you said about the graphics is true. Um, you know, by '88, it's possible that a lot of people that had already played Elite on their previous systems, uh, when they saw what the Amiga version of Elite brought to the table or what it didn't bring to the table in terms of updates, that might have turned them off. And that's yeah. part of the reason why I'm sure Frontier was such a blockbuster because they were like, finally, a real sequel to this thing, you know? Yeah, and Frontier, I will say, if you're going to go back and play one of these old games, that pro- of the two, oh, I would definitely yeah. pick I that I mean, uh, I think you that know? Elite is worth playing on either a BBC Micro or a Spectrum um, for the historic importance of it. But if you want a game, in my opinion, that still holds up to this day, then Frontier is the way to go. You know, you were mentioning that the, those the uh, all the, uh, the pomp and circumstance for those British magazines uh, for Elite, and I will say this, and I, I, I have no justification for this, but I will just say it as a person. I remember Elite being a big deal, and like, and not just because I, uh, in fact, at the time I didn't have an Amiga, but I mean, I remember when it came out, and a lot of my friends were talking well, I, about yeah. the game, so. Even over in America, like it had I'm a lot not of saying data. it wasn't a big a deal, but it. I'm saying if you took a top 10 games of all time list from America and you took a top 10 games of all time list from uh, England, Elite is going to be higher up on that list in England 10 times out of 10. Is that, do you think just because it's well, from yeah, England? Because, I mean, it came along at just the right time where, okay, first of all, it's a totally, you know, it was, it was built for these systems that were built for the British market. Okay, number one. Right. Number two, it was a game that was totally unique that no one had ever done before. It was a game that wasn't just a copy of something that had came before it. So I'm not saying that British people are wrong for taking pride in it. If it was an American game, I'd take a heck of a lot of pride in it too. Um, I, and, I agree. And it, and I, I think, but I think it had more and, Jack here than we did. And here, here's you know. the thing. It's not something that America ever really copied. You know, like there's, it's not like there was a, you know, an American developer or a Japanese developer that took concepts in Elite and and did something different. Or I mean, that did something similar. Of course, there were a lot of games that, that did trading and stuff like that, but there was nothing that was so sandboxy like Elite was, you know. Well, there were a few games. I mean, actually, there were a ton of games that came out after this that kind of But they were it. all 16-bit uh, games. Like well afterwards, there was nothing like on like the Atari yeah, I, or the C sixty four contemporaneously. Oh, you mean oh you mean between like between eighty four yeah, and say eighty nine? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you there. This was in fact this was the only. But I mean, eventually you guys. In fact, so I just saw somebody mention in here uh, a minute ago, Space Road, which is a game I played on the on the PC. That was a I think very there's a game called game. Privateer that's also similar to that. Yeah, yeah Pri- Privateer is uh, is in the Wing Commander mm, family, okay. I believe. Uh, but uh, yeah, but anyway, uh, I, uh, yeah. Uh, pretty you know i think it was pretty popular over here again you're you're right it's probably more popular in england um i looked this up on ebay uh boatster this one's a weird one man uh there were copies available there's a there 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 were copies available but there's only one copy available at, at the time i checked if you've got 500 bucks in germany you're in or best offer it's a box version but i did see this selling in the uk uh, for somewhere in the ballpark of thirty to uh, thirty six to seventy seventy five uh, bucks American mm-hmm. dollars, depending on the uh, depending on the uh, uh, condition of the game, so you can get this, but it's not going to be super cheap. I, I thought it actually. Probably I, I'm, more yeah, expensive, I'm surprised that I, to tell you the truth, uh, the uh, the box art is not what I'd call super inspired. Uh, you know, I, for a game like this, yeah, I wish that okay. it would have been like I love the Frontier box art. Maybe I'm just a total chill for Frontier. Maybe that's what it is. I will say uh, they probably sold 400 zillion mm-hmm. of these, and that's probably also, a lot of also that true. High, but I'm guessing if you want the whole enchilada with the no- the novella and all that stuff, that's probably going to cost you. So, I, but I didn't look that deeply into the pricing. Let's go to the Discord reviews, Aaron. First all up right, is man. Simulant. Simulant says, everything about Elite points to a true classic. It may well be remembered historically as one of the best games ever made for good reason. But last time I tried to dive back in, it reminded me how time-consuming legendary games can be. You definitely can't jump in for a quick blast through space. Surely that's a good thing. If you've got the time to really get into the game, then you'll get the reward. A Simulant simulation sensation. 8 out of 10. 
Oh, Absolutely. Everybody needs a gimmick. <laughs> Dave Velociraptor it. says, Elite is possibly the most influential game I've ever seen and one of the first games I played at length. Ten years old, seeing a Micro Center, an entire... Let me try that again. I, I read Micro Center, but that is not what the word said. Ten years old, seeing a Micro create an entire universe was incredible. The package with the novella was enough to light my imagination and set the scene for a game that is much deeper than the sum of its parts. Although the Amiga version has slightly more to it than the BBC, which is a 10 out of 10, it came out four years later than the original and in the mid 80s that's a lifetime for games, and fitting it into a 512k Amiga is not the same achievement as a 32k BBC. 9 out of 10. Lord Soup writes, 6 out of 10 with heavy caveats. A 10 out of 10 game that was kicked down the, store, the scoring not by competitors, but by its own creators in releasing games that so completely scratch the itch Elite creates. I wanted to say 10 out of 10, but after playing so much Frontier, ooh light, and a little Elite Dangerous, it's left a little in their wick. Add two or three points if you never played ooh light, ED, Frontier, or Federation of Free Traders. A landmark, a legend, historic, but you can get better experiences now. To be played on the way to Frontier, in my opinion. Frodo NL writes, It's been 34 years since I last played the original on the BBC Micro. It was the game we stayed in school for after hours until the janitor came to send us home. The Amiga version is nice. The graphics are a lot more colorful. Various screens have changed from text menus to menus with semi-recognizable graphics, but that was about the minimum one could hope for on a later generation machine. Had I played this version in the late 1980s, I probably would have scored it 9 out of 10 anyway, but looking at it now, it just seems slow and sometimes even tedious. 7 out of 10. Uh, Paul, aka Hermski, writes, A Herm Firm! 9 out of 10. This is a game I could not get into, but deserves a lot of respect, as I know many friends that put this game at the top of its class during the 8-bit era. They played Elite endless endlessly, completely emerging themselves into the role. I remember one friend back in the day having a bedroom wall dedicated to the game, displaying maps, notes, drawings, magazine cutouts, and control scribbles. It was his go-to game for years, carrying an Elite notebook around with him even at school. It's absolutely amazing that a game with eight galaxies, with each with over 250 planets, could be squashed into as little memory as a 32 is 32k. That alone deserves a 10 out of 10 rating. However, this is a port on the Amiga, a computer with more sophisticated capabilities with higher expectations. That is why, with trepidation, I've scored it a firm 9. And I just want to take a break, Aaron, and say, yeah, if you read the novella and really immersed yourself in the universe that way, you could get, you'll could get you get a lot more out of this game. I remember back in the days, you've heard me talk about the Trek Club, me and Chad. Yes. You know, if there was a video game that sort of where I could immerse myself like Elite and it had the Trek angle in it, I would have been all over it. You know, having the novella, we talk about feelings mm -hmm. and stuff in these old Emmerich Hall games. This is the perfect, whoever did that was a, quite a wise man. Because a game like Elite is perfect uh, for a companion piece like a novella, a space novella that goes into stuff. Because, I mean, when you boil down the action in Elite, uh, you need something. To, it helps, it would help to have something to spark that imagination. Uh, I like the fact that the guy mentioned uh, that, that that his buddy had the maps on the mm -hmm. wall and no took those. I remember when I was really into space rogue. I, in fact, I somewhere I've still got the map for it. Uh, that I had the map on my wall. I had a notebook full of notes, exactly the same thing. And it uh, because you really take a deep dive into something that and that makes it more fun. And clearly, Elite was that game yeah. for a lot of people because I think that's where those feelings come from. Uh, you know, and I will say uh, before you go on. The technical achievement of uh, even back when I played this the first time, and it wasn't my bag, but I did tour around the galaxy. It is remarkable. It it, it seems almost magical, the amount of distance and the the variety of uh, of places you can go. I don't know what procedural uh, uh, generator even meant back in those days. I, I vaguely <laughs> know now, but I mean it's 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 a remarkable. Uh, it's remarkable that someone could pull that up, and that, and that he's right. Having that on a, on a machine like the BBC Micro is even it's just astounding, mm -hmm. you know, that they mm -hmm. can do that. So it, it, there, there's a lot to be uh, uh, celebrated in that aspect. We got a couple more reviews. Jason Warren says, Savage, 7 out of 10. And finally, Chris Fold says, 
When this first came out on the 8-bits, I was too young to appreciate it, so the Amiga version is the one I, got first, I first got into and played. Going back to it today, it's hard, as the advancements in the genre by Frontier, Frontier First Encounters, and even Elite Dangerous make this seem a simplistic and sometimes frustrating affair, so I give it a score with a caveat. For the day and its place in history, 9 out of 10. However, sadly, like Dune 2, etc., it's a game quickly eclipsed in history and would only recommend it to the most diehard to go back to. Yeah. Mm. There you go. I mean, it's one mm -hmm. of those. That's all I had to say. But I mean, I, uh, I salute it, but I wouldn't want to go back and play it again. It's just, it's I don't have the time or the patience, my friend. And those docking procedures are worse, yeah. just the worst. They're double butt bad, mm -hmm. but they're worse, mm -hmm. man. All right, Aaron, as we roll on, I want to make it known to everyone that... <laughs> what? It's a That's right. Let it be known that uh, Amigathon 2018 is going to happen. Amigathon 2018 is back. Our fourth year. Our fourth year, Aaron, if you can believe it. Just like That's horsemen. right. Yeah. Um, this is... Uh, we have already raised $350. Thank you so much to everyone who has contributed. Awesome. Uh, Amigathon is now less than a month away. Uh, it is going to be oh, July God. 18th. <laughs> Starting at 12 noon UTC, you can go to Amigathon.com to donate. And we are going to be doing a um, D-Paint contest and a mod contest. So if you would like to enter that, please send me your submissions. Uh, send me a JPEG if you do a D-Paint submission. Send me a YouTube link to uh, your tracker playing your song for, a mod for the mod competition. And uh, we will actually be voting on those live during the event itself. Should be a great time. And of course, we'll be joined by Retro Man Cave and Amiga Bill, who will be doing uh, mini streams during the event. So it's going to be a great time. I'm really looking forward to this year's Amigathon. I am too. I, I, you know, I mentioned this when we announced this, and I want to say it now. Uh, this is a uh, rough time worldwide. We all know that. Uh, there's a, t I, and I can't speak for the rest of the world, but I know there's a ton of people that are out of work over here in the states. You know that boat. Unemployment's out the yin yang. Uh, it can be a difficult financial time, uh, and we don't expect everyone to drop everything they're doing and send money to, to the charity or the event, but. What all I ask is that you give us the support, tell your friends, just come by and just uh, hang out with us, and uh, and have a good time. Uh, we're going to uh, try to raise a few bucks for charity. We've done pretty good over the we years, have. boat. Uh, I'm and 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 uh, I know we've got a goal of uh, of a certain amount or whatever. But this is one of those times that you know, at times like this, charity is more important than than ever before, and it's a uh, it's a good time to uh, relax, though, chill out. We're gonna have 12 hours of game time. We got some uh, high-level buddies coming around to make it a lot of fun. Boat, I'm looking forward to it, and uh, I think it's this. This is gonna be one for the ages. I'm, I'm really planning. I'm gonna have a darn good time. I don't know what's gonna happen. I'm hoping I won't be sick or anything, but I, I, I'm ready to play some games, man. I'm ready to yeah, get it going. Yeah, me too. Me too. All right, and. As we move forward towards the inevitable inevitable Patreon song, I do want to announce uh, uh, the... Well, I want to thank, first of all, Cameron Armstrong, Amigos Game Selection Committee member, for choosing uh, Elite or suggesting it to the committee. And I want to thank the committee, the Amigos Game Selection Committee, for voting on it. Uh, quality title. Thank you, Cameron. It was very interesting. I was happy we went back and played it, despite the fact that it, was, it wasn't my well, cup it's, of tea. It's, uh, just because it's been a long time since I stepped right, into that absolutely. shit. Absolutely. And last week, uh, Aaron, uh, I don't know if you uh, you went back after the show because I know you can't listen with the with the audience. Did you go back and listen to the Patreon song from last week? I did, but I don't remember what it was. Well, this <laughs> is one that you might not have known because you were quite an old man when this came out. This came out in 1999, so you were already knocking on 40. And uh, this was. Uh, this was a song by a Brit pop band. Where do you stand on Brit pop, Aaron? I stand. I stand mm. near it. Okay. I like it. I like. I like. Okay. Some well, stuff. this was yeah. a band called Travis. Does that name ring a bell? Okay. Mm -mm. They had. I think that they had many hits in in England um, because they're still around. They had one hit in America, and it was "Why Does It Always Rain on Me." 
Have you heard mm-hmm. that one? No. Nope. Okay. No, I've never heard that one. Their name sucks. Travis. That's, that's the, the name. name. I hope the lead singer. I don't know. Travis, the lead please. singer Somebody now appears to be between seventy-five and eighty years old. He has not aged well. Um, I think he might have been old at the get-go. He was old from Jump Street. Um, but yeah. anyway, we had quite a few uh, correct answers for this one. This was, uh, like I said, a, pr- a pretty big hit. Um, Edvin Helland, Chris Folds, Mitsuyama, Bernard Lucas. Christian Russell, Paul Kitching, Pixels at Dawn, and Gary Heather. Congratulations, you are all winners of the Patreon Song Contest. Um, it must be pretty popular if all yeah, those people got yeah. it. Um, yeah. We, oh, Fran. We picked okay. up a couple uh, new supporters this past week, Aaron, Amigo supporters. I want to say a special hello to Olav Hope and Mark Byland. Uh, welcome, guys. And uh, we actually got one more too. Um, let me let me look him up because I don't want to leave him out. Uh, Say oh yeah, and oh Cello Code. I forgot about Cello Code. We welcome Cello Code as a new member of the Amigos Game Selection Committee. Oh, yeah. right up to yeah, big league. Right. Welcome aboard, Cello. Be good. Be kind. So I'm going to add him to the list for next week. And again, if you are a recent uh, Patreon supporter and uh, your name doesn't get in the song, sometimes I have to record the song whenever I can or the Patreon band because, you know, we're trying to coordinate that. Um, But don't worry. You'll be in it the next week for sure, all of you guys. So So Mark, Olog, and Cello. That's right. That should be the name of the band. (laughs) Much better than Travis. I agree with you. All right, Aaron. Uh, if you know the name of this week's Patreon song challenge, you can send me an email at john at amigospodcast.com. Here we go. This is for all those college music fans out there. And I think I know who you are. One, two, three, four. All of Hope, Hermski, Jonah, a.k.a. Simulant, Jeremy Jones, Ethan Little. Alien Breeder, Dave Velociraptor, Calbert Boy, Joel Fuchs, Lane Denson, Luke Hudson, John Cook, Rich Fury, Roshi, Frodo, and El Sol, Incisor Tech Mage, Jurgen, Mr. Cola, Daniel Williams, Bernard Lucas, Jerry Dennington, Zorg Love. Commodore Kid, Reflection, Simon Ledge. Captain Crispy, Kilobytes and Caffeine, Gary Heather, Free Lunch, Kate Fox, David Pickford, Cameron Armstrong. Andy Jones, Lobsterminator, Ten Minute Amiga, Retro Cast, Bernard Quinn, Retro Man Cave, Tim Drew. Simon Rose, Joseph Harrison, Kyle Edda, Rob O'Hara, Matthew, Lara Moore, Andy Craig, Shonzo, Barfit, Roland Burke, Andrew Monks, Joe the Zombie, Lee Pilon, Alan K. Bob, Checo, Tay, Level Lord, John Marshall, Matthew Perron, Ricky DeRoche, Creepy Dead Boy. Biggest CTZ, Stefan, Sword Guy, Mortensen, Edmonton, Blindo 75, Christopher Hassel, Ravi Abbott, Chris Folds, Green Ketcher, Lauren Jeru, Bram Bebke, Adam Batters, B. O'Brien's Retro and Vintage, Gary Hucker, C. Brian Jones, Paul Bossman, Harrington, Duncan Styles, Tapes from the Crypt, Josh Nan, Adam Bradley, Jonas, Rulo, THT, and Eric Nelson, Kim Tommy Humberstad, Daniel Bingston, Brutal Barracuda, Darren Coles, Jason Holmes, Pixel. And Bjorn Barman. Nailed it. All right. So that one, a little bit more of a deeper cut uh, this week. Uh, the, the, the Travis song is just deeper yeah, than that? Yeah, this is, this is deeper than the Travis song. However, I will give you a clue. 
It has something to do with my nickname. So do with that what you will. Snuggle yes. Bunny. All right, Aaron. Next week, it's Arcade Week in Amigos. Yeah. All right. We love ourselves a good arcade game. We are going to be covering the um, the port of Bubble Bobble for the Amiga. Not one of your favorites, I know. <laughs> but, uh, but we will be uh, we will be talking about that, and of course we will be revealing the grand prize winner of the Amigos Discord High Score Challenge. So be sure to Ooh. tune in for that as well. All right, Aaron. Well, it's been a good show, and I'll see you again next week. Until then. Will do, sir. Adios. Adios.